Welcome everyone and thank you for watching our Road to the Top series. My name is Andrea McReynolds and I am president of the Highland Dancers Association of Ontario or HDAO. Um, the HDAO runs the Highland Dancing at Fergus Scottish Festival as well as several other uh, Highland Games in Ontario. Uh, in addition, we run several indoor competitions in the winter months and our flagship Ontario Closed Championship in early June, which is the selection meet for the Canadian Championship in our province. Um, we're really happy to be helping Fergus again this year with the We Digital Kaylee. Um, I hope that you have uh, enjoyed some of the dancing videos that are also uh, available as part of the Kaylee. In this Road to the Top series, we will be talking about uh, the competitive nature of Highland dancing and the history of Highland dancing. A little bit of a background for those of you who aren't familiar with um, Highland dancing and, and how it works from a competitive standpoint. Um, there's a lot of interviews with active dancers uh, at every level of competition, um, from the very youngest primary dancers up to uh, elite world champion level dancers. To start off though, uh, we will discuss the competitive structure and history of Highland dancing, both here in Ontario and worldwide. I am thrilled to welcome Jacqueline Smith, a four-time world champion, including the first Canadian to win the adult world championships at Cowell, and the first North American to win all three world championship titles, juvenile, junior, and adult. Jacqueline is also a six-time Canadian champion and seven-time Ontario champion. And she is now a respected teacher and adjudicator. Welcome, Jackie. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me today, Andrea. I look forward to speaking about Highland dancing, something that I'm very passionate about. And of course, my favorite Highland Games, uh, the Fergus Scottish Festival. That's great. So we're going to jump right in and maybe talk a little bit about the Highland dances. Um, in particular and a little bit of history of them and um, maybe touch a little bit on the national dances. So um, the Highland dances are the main ones that we compete and there's four of them. And Jackie, do you want to maybe touch on a little bit of the history? Sure. So with Highland dancing, it dates back to like the 11th century and it was used as a form of exercise um, in the military um, to develop strength, stamina, agility, accuracy. So Highland dancing, I consider it as a sport as well as an art form as well. Um, the main dances that we do, um, they all have historical meaning, which makes Highland dancing really unique. Um, so we have our Highland dances. Um, the most well-known ones are the Highland Fling, the Sword Dance, the Sean Trues, and then we have the Strathspey and Highland Reel or Tulloch. And then we have our national dances, which are softer. Um, they were done more by the females originally. Uh, with Highland dancing, it was primarily done by men um, way back, but now um, I would say it's more more dominantly female. So there are quite a few males, but it's mainly females that do Highland dancing these days. And um, so both males and females, everybody does all of the dances, the Highland dances, as well as the lesser known dances, the national dances, as well as we have um, a couple character dances, the Sailor's Hornpipe and the Irish Jig. Um, so those are fun dances as well. But the dances that are the most common, um, as I said, the Highland Fling, which is a dance of victory, um, said to be danced over um, the opponent's sword. And there was like a, um, sorry, the opponent's shield, and there'd be a sharp um, spike kind of in the middle. Um, so dancers do a lot of the movements to depict very sharp movements. Um, they aim to stay on one spot because the shield wasn't very big. And so that was a dance of victory. A lot of the historical meaning all comes from um, before or after battle. Um, so the Highland Fling is very, very uh, common and is danced at most Highland games and uh, um, championships as well. And then we have the sword dance. Um, the sword dance is, there's lots of different meanings um, with these dances, of course, right? So, but the ones that we kind of live by at our studio is, um, you know, it was just said to be a bad omen that if you touch the sword um, with your feet that the, um, the Highlanders would be unsuccessful in battle. So when you're seeing the dancers dancing. Yeah, that's I think a pretty dominant part of the history. Yeah. 
Yeah, so any audience, anybody watching is always looking, the judges as well are always looking to make sure that the dancers aren't touching the sore with their feet. Wow. So in the, um, yeah, so that's, that's really quite interesting about the history of the sore dance. And then the chantreuse, another very common one, which is Gaelic for old trousers. Um, chantreuse is definitely my favorite dance. I love to dance it, I love to watch it. Um, but it was all about um, shedding the trousers. So the Highlanders never liked to wear trousers. So they always, so the movements in this dance depict trying to take off their trousers, all the shaking movements um, to get back to wearing at the kilt. So they love the freedom of wearing the kilt. And so it was kind of seen as a dance of celebration once they were allowed to all wear their kilts again. Yeah. 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 And then the other dance that's very common, that's um, the fling sword and chantreuse, and most of the dancers are all done individually. You get judged individually. But the Strass Bay and Highland Reel, it's danced with four dancers. And that was always a dance that was done um, when people were waiting outside of a church, they say, to, and to try to keep warm, they would dance amongst and through each other and around each other to keep warm. Yeah, so. the, the reels are really the only dance where there's, even though they're still judged individually, where there's interaction and, and there's a requirement for four dancers, whereas everything right. else is always individual. So I think if people were coming up to a competition and wondering why dancers are sort of figure eighting around each other and not and thinking that it could be a team event, but it's yeah. still individual, right? It's still individual, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right. And then you have That's the national Yeah. Do you oh, want to talk a bit about your national dances um, that are very common as well, but they're lesser known. Um, and they we wear the Aboyan costume um, if you're a female, and then um, males can wear their trousers. Um, and so they have the Flora McDonald's Fancy, the Scottish Lilt, the Village Maid. Um, there's Blue Bonnets. There's quite a few national dances that are softer. Yeah. And graceful and flowing. And those are also danced. Both the Highland dances and the national dances are danced at Fergus every year. They're right. separate, uh, held as separate competitions, but they're they're danced. So it's a we cover them all at Fergus, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what's so awesome about Fergus Scottish Festival is you really do cover it all, and there's something for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, how competition works. Um, and let's talk about how it works today, which is much more structured than when we were competing um, or when we started competing anyways. Um, I think it was in 1994 that there became the worldwide registration scheme. And um, Highland Dancing Worldwide is governed by the Royal Scottish Official Board of Highland Dancing. Um, and then within each country, there are, um, country affiliates. So they're affiliated with the board, but then they're the governing body in Canada. So in Canada, or sorry, in their country, in Canada, it's Scott Dance Canada. Um, and they set country specific rules. Um, but the, the board in Scotland is the main, they set the main yeah. rules and then they flow down. So <clears throat> in 94, the worldwide registration scheme came in and that sort of I don't know if it renamed a lot of the <laughs> categories, but it certainly formalized the process and kept a better track of where we are today. So um, I'll just sort of touch on the different categories one at a time, and then you can um, maybe just give a little bit of a explainer about each category. So the first one is the primary group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these dancers are um, under seven. Um, so, and they will be dancing potty boss, potty boss and high cuts, the fling or the sword. Um, they can do all four, they could do one. It's a, you don't have to do all of them. There's no overall trophy at the end. In primary, it's just individual um, results. And what's interesting is that before they used to have very similar to primary, but they called it baby class. And um, so that was, I mean, talking to some friends that danced in baby class, I didn't um, actually dance in baby class. I didn't start dancing until I was seven. Um, so I kind of never started there. Same with you, Andrea. Did you? Yeah, did I was seven or eight. I think. Yeah. So I was kind of asking and, and I, 
I do remember potty boss and potty boss and high cuts just being introduced for primary. So they never had that in baby class before. It was always right, just fling sword Sean Trues. Um, that's what you start off with um, even in baby class. So they have, yeah, so primary is under seven and you can do um, potty boss, 16 potty boss, potty boss and high cuts, fling or sword, all cut steps. Yeah, and they're, they're the, <clears throat> you know, four, five, six year old dancers getting up for the first time quite often to dance yep. on a stage. So it's really like an introductory um, level for, for the really young ones um, to get them comfortable. You know, for a five-year-old to stand up in front of a crowd of people and dance is a pretty big deal. So it's always oh. cute to watch them. Oh, for sure. It takes a lot of courage to get up in front of all those people. For you sure. know, at Highland Games, like Fergus, tons of spectators not just the families there's um just it's open to the public so it's it's quite something when when dancers of that age can get up and uh and do their potty boss for sure yeah i agree yeah. so then the next category is uh beginners which um you can maybe touch on you like you move into as soon as you turn seven yeah, so you automatically, as soon as you turn seven, you go into beginners. And beginners, um, well, again, back, back, way back when, when we danced, it was, um, you know, you would have your beginners, then you would have your novice, you would have your intermediate, your advanced intermediate, and then open. Um, so things have changed where you now have beginner, novice, intermediate, and premier. So there's no longer the advanced intermediate and open has basically changed names to premier right. so you move up the levels and it has changed over the years as well but now what it is is that for the highland dances and beginners you can get stamps um, on a card on your worldwide registration dance card you have um, for first second or third in any of your highland dances and once you have six stamps um, from six different competitions um, you can move up to the next category, which is novice, or you can stay in that beginner category for a year. So you, that's been changed. It has changed over the years, but it, right now it is a year. So from that first stamp, yeah. um, so you can stay there. So you'd move up to novice. Once you get into novice, then you have, you can do the same dances, but you'll also get stamps for your national dances as well, like the flora and the lilt as well. Yeah. And so the same ruling applies where six stamps, so six competitions where you get a first, second, or third, um, or stay, you can stay in there for 12 months from your first stamp. And then you move up to intermediate, and other dancers are, introdu other dances are introduced in intermediate, like the hornpipe, the jig, um, barracks, laddie, so other dances um, that are a little bit lesser known. And then um, once you're you've got your stamps in intermediate or stayed for um, a year, then you can move up to the highest level of competition, premier. And once you're in premier, you're really competing against your age groups. Um, and that's the highest level of competition. So um, then you kind of work towards what we call championships. Yeah, so it's really like a staged um, process so that as kids um, and dancers progress in their skill level, and they can start to learn more dances and then they move up and um the yeah. stamps like so if you're a dancer and you get for first at, at a competition in beginner you still only get one stamp yeah. so it, it, it is they want to make sure that you're not moving too fast but you do have the option to move up if you want but um it's it's when we were dancing it was all um no stamps. It was just the honor system. So it's it's a lot more organized now, and uh, I think to the benefit of the dancers and and the parents and people know, um, I guess where they're supposed to be. You yes. know, like everybody. It's and then um, yeah. Um, what? We, go ahead. I was just going to say it also allows like dancers who like some dancers compete like every weekend, they travel a lot. Other dancers, maybe they don't compete during the summer or they just compete once a month. So it really allows dancers not to be, to have to move up, um, you know, too quickly. Um, and then others that compete a lot, they can, and they're competing a lot um, regularly and doing well. Um, it really 
um, they can move up the levels quicker. So it all really just allows the dancer um, to kind of choose their level of competition and competitiveness um, with having these um, different categories and the stamps. Yeah. And then once, as you said, once you're in premier, you're just dancing on an age level. So, I mean, there's some premier dancers who are seven or eight years old and there's some who are 30 yeah, <laughs> or yeah. older now. So, you know, it's all uh, regimented by age. Um, there are rules now, which there didn't used to be, that if you're under 12, you can only do cut steps. Right. 12, right? Yep. Yep. And then older, yeah. it's full steps. So yeah. for example, in the fling, a full step fling is six steps and a cut step fling is four steps. Yeah. So um, yeah. again, acknowledging that those younger dancers from a stamina and, and um, yeah. skill and whatever, they, that it's a bit much to ask them to do the full steps. But yeah, when we were dancing, if you remember, it was all, we didn't know what cut steps were until like in the beginning, because we did all six steps. You just started, that was all you knew and beginner novice, it was all, you know, six step flings, um, three and one swords. Yeah, so, so it's great that they brought the cut step into, um, into Highland dancing. And sometimes it can be quite hot out at the Highland game. So when you're doing a cut step versus a long step, it's, uh, it's oh, yeah. nice to <laughs> I, I remember being at Fergus, like when, once they allowed cut steps, I think it was Fergus, but anyways, some of the games where it was like boiling hot and you'd be up at the announcer desk going, are you going to cut the steps? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, cut the, like, please cut the steps. Yeah. 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 For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about competitions versus championships. So um, only premier dancers can compete in a championship. Yes. Regular competitions are from primary all the way up to premier. And in a regular competition, there is one judge. And in a championship, there are three. Yeah. Right? Yep. And um, each judge judges individually. And then those uh, in a championship. And then their placings are sort of tabulated to figure out who won that dance. Right? So yep. they they could the same dancer could have gotten a first in the fling from all three of the judges or could have gotten a first a second and a third but and it figures out from the three um yeah. who wins yes. now championships like in this road to the top series right like competitions are the focus when you're in, in pre-premiere and um probably a little bit as a new premier dancer but I think the aim of most premier dancers is to be able to compete and place in championships and uh, possibly become a champion at some point. Yeah. Um, I think that's quite um, everybody's goal. Like if you, as you get into premier, once you've got to that highest level of competition, the next goal is usually to become a champion. Um, they do also have pre-championships that you can do prior to championships to prepare you for that championship because it is quite quite different having one judge in front of you at a competition. But sometimes you can see it as being advantageous to have three judges judging you um, at the championship because um, the standard of Highland dancing um, is quite quite high and. So to have three judges um, judging you on your, you know, 80% of your technique, 10% of your timing, 10% of your deportment, um, there can be some differences in the judging. So having three, um, sometimes it can be somebody who gets all seconds um, is the actual most consistent and um, can can end up winning the the event. That's so, true. Yeah. But there is a, still like a build up in premier as well when you do the pre championship and then can move into the championships. Yeah, and I think that um, like there are. I, I feel like there's more championship. There, I feel like there's more competitions and there's more championships now. Yeah. Than there there's used open, to be. Yeah, there's open championships a bit open to anybody, and then there's the closed championships, like provincials and um, as well. So I do find there are quite. There's more and more all the time. Yeah. So in Ontario, we have the Ontario Clothes Championship and it is closed to Ontario dancers um, by birth or residency. And um, 
that's been running for like 75 years, I think now. And um, since, I don't know, sometime in the 70s, it's been used as the selection meet for the Canadian championship. And so dancers from across Ontario come, compete at the Canadian, uh, sorry, at the Ontario's. The top three in every age group gets to go dance at the Canadians as the provincial, as a provincial representative. And then uh, all the provinces have three, three reps per age category. Um, and then that group competes uh, for the Canadian championship. And that's really grown over time too, from just being, a, you know, kind of a one day event into a week long, multi-competition, yeah. multi-event uh, oh, sure. week. Yeah, because when um, back when we were dancing, um, we would only really travel to the Canadian Championships if we were representing our province. But now I find that there's something for everyone at those events as well, and it runs over five days. And so um, I do find people are traveling a lot more, and it, it gives everybody the opportunity to see the country as well. You know, every year it's in a different province, and um, you kind of can make a little vacation of it as well. Yeah, yeah. And I find, like, not only is it premier dancers, it's primary on up. There's, Absolutely. yeah, because there's, while the Canadian Championship is the flagship day of, of the championship series, there are lots of different competitions for everybody. So, um, yeah, that's become a really big hallmark. And now you have people come from the U.S., from yeah. Scotland. It's a pretty big worldwide event, I would say, yeah. as well. Oh, for sure. There's always so many things to do for the socializing as well aspect of the, the yeah. event as well. The pin exchange and, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Um, and then the, what's different between the provincial and Canadian level uh, to the world is that the world is an open event. So yeah. anybody in the world can go dance at the world. Yeah. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the age groups and how you, you do have to qualify to dance at the world, but let's explain how it differs. And there's, maybe you can talk about the three different age groups and how sure. the qualification works. Yeah, so that's changed a lot over the years as well. Um, the most recent is, well, we always have the, there's the juvenile championship, which is for dancers um, 15 and under. And then you have the junior world championships, which is for dancers 16 and 17 years of age. And then the adult world championship, which is for dancers 18 and over. Um, there's always a qualifier before, yes. So just as um, you'd mentioned that anybody can actually compete in the heats and the qualifiers um, for the final world championships. Um, so now what they have is it's two days before they'll have the qualifying heat. So there is the Scottish championships for dancers um, 15 and under. You can still, that's classified as a championship. And then, um, but on the Saturday is the actual finals of the world championship. So the dancers that qualify um, from 12 years of age, there's individual age groups, 12, 13, 14, and 15, and all those dancers will compete in the juvenile world championship. So four from each, the four top dancers from each group will qualify and compete in the juvenile world championship. And then the um, junior and adult, um, there's usually two heats, um, an A and a B, and the dancers in those groups, um, there's the top 10 that will qualify in each heat um, to compete in the junior world championship. And then the same as in the um, adult world championship. But that has changed a lot over the years. Um, it used to, we used to um, be competing um, on the same day as the finals and that sort of thing. But they've really, just with the way that Highland Dancing has evolved and, um, they kind of allow a rest day now for those dancers, which is great if they want it. But I believe the Scottish dancers can still compete in an event, like a closed refined um, championship for them as well the day before if they'd like to. Um, but it gives a day's rest to, to get ready for the finals. So what I also find different now is that more people I find are going to Scotland and more frequently. Like 
uh, and at a younger age. So those dancers who are having success in Ontario or in Canada or in the U S yeah. like a lot, they're going a lot earlier and, and, uh, and more frequently like every year. Yep, and I think that once you go over um, and you get a taste of it, like I've had dancers go over not knowing what to expect, and it really is something else. Um, just the atmosphere, um, I've never had a dancer go over and not want to go back the next year. You know, it's, uh, it's really something else. But yeah, back when we danced, I mean, I didn't go over until I was 14. That was my first year, um, even though I had been somewhat successful in Ontario and Canada. Um, prior to that for a couple of years before I didn't actually go over to 14. But like you said, dancers are going over, you know, as young as like eight years old. Um, yeah. They're in premiere and uh, started getting the taste of it and uh, getting on that road. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It's definitely, um, I think everything is shifted down in age now. Yes. You know, from a competitive standpoint you know what I mean like from from becoming elite and trying to to um uh compete yeah, at dancers that level are doing really, yeah dancers are doing really really well and um from a very very young age but it's always been that way um in Scotland the dancers are always very very strong at a very young age so it's good for dancers that want to get to that um, competition level against the um, Scottish dancers, it's good to get over and see kind of what they're up against. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So to, just to talk a little bit, um, you know, I mentioned your success as a, a Canadian dancer in Scotland, but let's talk about Ontario a little bit because, I mean, it has always been um, a hotbed of Highland dancing and we've always had uh, a very, very strong um, dancing community. I think that's in part because of the number of competitions that we have in a very small radius, really, you know, a couple hours drive from the city. But I had um, looked this up for, for something else, but as you mentioned, there's three world champion titles, jun juvenile, junior, and adult. So Ontario has had 13 distinct world champions. So 13 people yep. have been world champion. Those 13 people hold a total of 36 world titles. Um, and of that, there were five distinct adult world champions with a yeah, total of 14 adult world world uh titles so like that record for ontario that's not even canada that's ontario and that's yeah. second only to scotland and you know arguably they have an advantage because they can be there every year year yeah. in year out right yeah. so I, I think that um you know canada there's strong dancers across the country for sure but ontario is definitely um got some of the, the best dancers oh, and always sure. have. Always. I think that it's kind of always been a known fact that if you um, are successful in Ontario, um, you, you can be successful all over the world. Um, I think it's just because we are very fortunate to have so many Highland um, competitions and championships um, that there never really is a time to slack off, I guess. And, you know, um, competition. So, yeah, the standard of Highland dancing um, in Ontario has always been very strong. I, and I, I do believe it's just because we have so many competitions um, available to dancers. And um, just I think there's great teachers as well that, um, that produce, whether they were good dancers before or not. It, you don't have to be a good dancer to be a good teacher. I think um, there's a lot of successful um, studios in Ontario that just um, keep on, when you're in a studio that has good dancers or in a field that has good dancers, it just makes the field stronger. Um, I know back when I was competing, I mean, one of my competitors, um, you know, we would go back to back many, many times as Don Brennan. And um, we one year tied at Canadians and we would, we were on the stage crying saying, if it wasn't for you, you know, because it was, we knew that we were um, only as good as we were because of 
each other type thing and because of our competitors. So I think Ontario is very blessed to have that strong um, competitions and um, it carries through across the world. Absolutely. You know, if you know that um, who you're going to be up against, it incentivizes you to, to work to that bar. And like you said, the teachers also know what the levels are and who else is out there. And I think everything, the bar just, you know, continues to get raised, but it's beautiful. I mean, when you go to, I know years ago, I took my little, my boys when they were quite young and my husband and they don't know a lot about the Highland world. And at the time, Daniel Carr, who is a world champion from Ontario as well. And he was world champion at the, at the time. Yeah. Um, he was dancing and my boys were fascinated with the fact that there was a boy dancer because you don't see them that often yeah. but then their chins dropped when I said well he's world champion like right. he's the reigning world champion right now and I think that people don't realize like when they go to um, any of the Highland Games but Fergus especially um, that they're watching some of the best dancers in the world compete sure. you know yeah. um, and yeah. I think that um, something that we had talked about as well. Fergus, like we've mentioned that it's a two day event. There's so many different competitions for all levels of dancers over the two days. Um, it's a lot of fun. The games, like a lot of people camp. It's like a really, there's a big social part to it as well. Um, but it's also really the last big games of the season. And it's for a lot of dancers, it's the last hurrah before they leave for Scotland for the world. Absolutely. Yeah, Fergus has always been um, my favorite. I know so many people, other people's favorite uh, events. It's really grown over the years and the two day event. I mean, going, starting in Victoria Park where you could watch everything is just outgrown and is, is now um, at the location with all the camp. It's just a wonderful weekend. Great vendors, great entertainment. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, the dancing has come a long way with respect to dance area with having the covered tent and I mean how many judges would you have like six judges six platforms going yeah yeah so it's uh pretty amazing yeah you know, it's a beautiful yeah, it's a long day. stage it's yeah. a long stage there yeah so we usually have in the morning um on the Saturday morning a uh, competition for the pre-premiere dancers and six stages are running uh mm -hmm. and then in the afternoon we have the championship for the premieres so then we have two stages with three judges each. And then Sunday, we there's nationals and yep. other stuff. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. It's fun. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I think we've kind of hit all the high spots. I think so. That I was good. So. Yeah. yeah that was um, I hope for those of you who are new to Highland Dancing that um, you could follow along with how it works and maybe next year at Fergus you'll be able to uh, stop by the dancing and understand it a little bit better and, and uh, maybe see all those wee ones those must be the primary dancers and uh, um, yeah. if you know there's three judges watching some of the dancers then you know you're watching the championship and probably some of the best dancers in the world so um, Jackie thank you so much for being part of this um, and for explaining a lot of how uh, dancing works with me here um, and well, thank you very, thank you very much for having me that was fun that's good okay well we hope to see you guys all next year and uh, thanks again Jackie thank you